welcome to the CEC Gurukul live lecture series on introduction to Indian philosophy and our today's topic is the Shramana movement or the Shramana sect. In the earlier lectures I discussed the division in Indian philosophy between the Astika and Nastika schools. The Astika believed in the authority of the Vedas while the Nastika rejected any such authority of the Vedas. But we must be careful about the misinterpretations regarding this division. Because driven by the West, we associate uh, the words Astika and Nastika with theism and atheism. And you know, theism is the belief in the existence of God and atheism is the belief that there is no God. There is another interpretation according to which theism is the belief in afterlife, rebirth, liberation, etc. And there is a verse in a Buddhist text itself in which uh, Nagarjuna says a Nastika is doomed to hell. And I'm sure he was not talking about himself. So probably for him, a Nastika is one who does not believe in afterlife or rebirth or liberation. But you will uh, witness as we discuss uh, the various schools of Indian philosophy that this division between the Astika and Nastika is regarding the acceptance and rejection of the Vedic authority only. And I can corroborate this with a few examples. Buddhism is a Nastika school uh, in this context, despite their belief in rebirth or another world and liberation. Jainism again is a Nastika school but believes in the concept of soul and rebirth, while Sankhya school, which belongs to the Astika tradition, does not have any concept of God. So, to avoid such misinterpretations, there have been suggestions by people for having more appropriate labels for this division in schools. So, some prefer to call them Brahmanic and non-Brahmanic, while others suggest uh, the terms Vedika and Avedika. And with time, these non-Brahmanic or Avedika or the heterodox schools were characterized as belonging to the Shramana sect. And of this sect, the Buddhist and the Jainas are most dominating. This was probably because the other groups did not have any independent literary work belonging to them. So, their thoughts were recorded either in the Buddhist or the Jaina literature or in their criticisms by the other schools of thought. However, the Shramana sect unanimously upholds the following sentiments. The Vedas have no authority. Members of all castes, religions and social status are to be embraced and integrated into their systems. No division of people based on Varna and Ashrama. A person is responsible for his own actions. One must work on moral, mental and spiritual development for getting out of the cycle of birth and death. Liberation can be attained by anybody. Rituals are of no use in the attainment of liberation. Emphasis must be on detachment from the objects of this world as they are impediments in the path to liberation. And let us now understand the meaning of the word Shramana. The word Shramana comes from the word Shrama which means to exert effort labor or to perform austerity. The Brihidaranyaka Upanishad in one of the verses uses the word Shramana to refer to a monk. But who is a monk? The answer to this question is given in the Rig Veda. It says that a monk is one who has long loose hair, who wears dirty or yellow tone clothes. He is a homeless wanderer who travels with wind to the spiritual world. 
So, initially the word Shramana referred to the ascetic of the Vedic tradition. However, with time it, beca it became a label for the anti-Vedic or anti-Brahmanic movement. In the Buddhist tradition, the word Samana means quieting or Samita of evil or Papa. This has been inferred from the Buddhist text Dhammapada, which belongs to the 3rd century BCE, where it is said, uh, Samitatta Papanam Samano Pavuchati, which means one who has pacified evil is called Samana. The Buddha said that a real Samana is one who has got rid of covetousness, ignorance and mastered the four meditations which come under the label Brahma Vihara, that is friendliness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. At another place he says the real Samana is he who has acquired a perfectly purified conduct in speech, thought and mode of living by controlling the sense organs, moderation in eating, being intent on vigilance, being possessed of mindfulness and clear consciousness, remote lodging uh, in forests to get rid of doubt getting rid of the five hindrances and being aloof from pleasures of the senses, he enters on the four meditations one by one. Before moving on to discuss Jainism and Buddhism in detail, I would like to discuss a few lesser known philosophers or teachers of the Shramana sect and understand their views. These philosophers have been mentioned in the Buddhist and Jaina texts but mostly in the Buddhist literature. It is believed that Buddha himself discussed them in his discourses and that they were uh, contemporaries of uh, both Mahavira and Gautam Buddha. There are six Shramanas uh, discussed in the Samanaphala Sutta of the Digha Nikaya, which is a Buddhist Pali scripture. This is the only literature available which discusses the six Shramanas elaborately. They are Purna Kasapa, Pakhuda Kachayana, Makhali Gosala, Ajita Kesha Kambalin, Sanjaya Bilatti Putta and Nigantha Nata Putta. These six were the leaders of their order or Sangha and they were ascetics of high repute. In the Jaina literature, uh, there is reference only to Purna Kasapa, Makhali Gosala and Sanjaya Bilatti Putta. But we must keep in mind that um, we uh, we, we, we uh, shall be understanding these five thinkers from the Buddhist perspective, which may very well be a biased one. But uh, we don't have a choice as that is the only written account available to us. You may be uh, wondering why I said five and not six thinkers. There is a reason for this. The ascetic teacher Nigantha Nata Putta is none other than Mahavira himself, the 24th Tirthankara of the Jaina tradition. And there is no dearth of literature on him. Now coming back to the point. In the 6th century BCE, when Buddha and the six ascetic leaders were propounding their theories, India was witnessing a great upheaval in the intellectual world. There were contradictory theories and views that were doing rounds regarding the universe and man's place in it. And as we discuss these different theories of uh, these six leaders, uh, you will know what I mean. But before that, I must tell you uh, about the interesting narrative that is built in the Samanaphala Sutta to introduce these six ascetic leaders. Now, King Ajat Shatru, the ruler of Magadha, um, is uh, 
a contemporary of all these thinkers and uh, was in a very confused state and needed spiritual guidance. Seeing the state of the king, his minister suggested to him the names of these six ascetic leaders to seek their guidance so that his confusion is removed and his mind is at peace. But neither of the six could help King Ajat Shatru and his mind was still in the state of agitation. Then someone in the assembly recommended the name of Buddha, who fortunately was in Rajgriha, the capital of Magadha at that time. King Ajat Shatru liked the idea and he went to the place where Buddha was staying with his 1,250 disciples. On meeting the Buddha, the king asked him about his confusion and said, the fruits of various worldly trades and professions are obvious, but is it possible to show any appreciable benefit to be derived from asceticism? And he at the same time declared to the Buddha that none of the six heretics could satisfactorily answer this question. They all seemed to be avoiding giving an answer and what they said was not in tune with logic. They were only repeating the conventions or aphorisms of their system. After hearing all this from the king, Buddha preached to him the advantages of asceticism. And the king was overjoyed and overawed by the answer and charisma of Buddha. Now, the other five heretics were of course not as popular as the Buddha and the Mahavira were, but because they are mentioned in the Samanaphala Sutta, it proves that they must have had a significant place in those times, despite having only a little following. Let us first discuss Purna Kasapa as he was called in the Pali tradition and Purna Kashyapa in Sanskrit. The word Purna means perfection and so it is believed that uh, Purna Kasapa was a teacher with perfect wisdom. He probably was a Brahmin by birth. The philosophy or theory associated with him is called Akriyavad or the no action theory. Now, according to a Kriya Vada, no action, good or bad, can ever affect the soul, for it is only the body that performs an action. The soul does not act. This theory can possibly be related to a Hetu Vada. The theory that there is no cause of anything. Buddha himself said that there is neither a Hetu that is cause nor a Pachaya that is a condition for the purity or impurity of a person in the theory of Purna Kasapa. When King Ajat Chatru visited Purna Kasapa, he got the following instructions from him. He who performs an act or causes an act to be performed, he who destroys life, the thief, the housebreaker, the plunderer, the highway robber, the adulterer and the liar, commit no sin. Even if with a razor sharp discus a man reduces all the life on earth to a single heap of flesh, he commits no sin. If he come down the south bank of the Ganges, slaying, maiming and torturing and causing others to be slain, maimed or tortured, he commits no sin, neither does sin approach him. Likewise, if a man go down the north bank of the Ganges, giving alms and sacrificing and causing alms to be given and sacrifices to be performed, he acquires no merit. Neither does merit approach him. From liberality, self-control, abstinence and honesty is derived neither merit nor the approach of merit. So, 
it's evident that good and bad actions have nothing to do with purifying or defiling the individual. It is believed that Purna Kasapa was endowed with introspective knowledge. He could experience the finite world with his infinite knowledge. And in the commentary on Dhammapada, it is written that he committed suicide by drowning himself. According to this commentary, when uh, these ascetic leaders failed to prevent the Buddha from gaining the miraculous powers, they all ran away. And while fleeing, Purna Kasapa saw one of his disciples carrying a vessel and a rope. He took them from him tied the vessel round his neck and threw himself into the river and committed suicide. Don't know how far it is true, but this is what the commentary says. Let us now discuss the second ascetic teacher of the Shramana sect, Pakhuda Kachayana, as he is called in the Pali tradition and Prakhuda Katyayana in Sanskrit. The word Prakhuda in Sanskrit means furious. Some people have also interpreted the name to mean a man with a hump on his back. Pakhura Kachayana had a very good uh, reputation. He is believed to have been the leader or the leading light of some uh, religious order. His uh, views can be ascertained from two sources, namely uh, Samanapala Sutta and uh, Sutra uh, Sutra Tanga. Uh, and one can easily establish from these two sources that he propagated eternalism, which was tied to his Anuvad or the atomic theory. According to Samanapala Sutta, uh, Kachayana accepts seven eternal elements. They are earth, water, fire, air, pleasure, pain and soul and these elements never interact with one another. He says, the following seven things are neither made nor commanded to be made, neither created nor caused to be created. They are barren so that nothing is produced out of them steadfast as a mountain peak, as a pillar firmly fixed. They move not, neither do they vary. They trench not one upon another, nor avail aught as to ease, pleasure, or pain, or both. And what are the seven? The four elements, earth, water, fire, and air and ease that is pleasure and pain and the soul as a seventh. So there is neither slayer nor causer of slaying, hearer or speaker, knower or explainer. When one with sharp sword cleaves a head in twain, no one thereby deprives any one of life. A sword has only penetrated into the interval between seven elementary substances. Many writers in the modern times uh, equate Kachayana with the Greek philosopher Empedocles for upholding a similar kind of atomic theory in which earth, water, fire and air are the basic principles. However, the formative principles of love and hatred proposed by Empedocles are replaced with pleasure and pain by Kachayana. According to uh, Buddha Ghosha, who is a 5th century Buddhist philosopher, Pakhura Kachayana never touched cold water. He always used hot water and if hot water was not available, he would not wash. He also did not cross any river, for he considered crossing a river a sin. And if he ever had to cross any river, he would atone for it or make amends by constructing a mound on earth. Imagine, so difficult. The third ascetic teacher from the Shramana sect is Makkali Gosala. He is said to be associated with the Ajivika sect. 
However, before uh, him, the Ajivika tradition was uh, led by Nandavacha and Kisa Sankicha. Ajivikas were the wandering ascetics who practiced religious mendicancy to attain salvation. In fact, they were quite strict as far as um, earning their livelihood was concerned. It is believed that they earned their livelihood by practicing astrology, fortune telling, etc. Before turning to Makali Gosala, a few things about Nandavacha and uh, Kisa Sankicha, who were either his predecessors or his contemporaries. There is no conclusive evidence on this. But one thing is clear that these three were the most popular and respected Ajivika teachers. There is a Jataka which mentions the name of Nandavacha and Kisa Sankicha. But before that, let me first tell you what, a, what uh, Jatakas are. Jatakas are the tales concerning the various births of Gautam Buddha in both human and animal forms. In each Jataka tale, the Buddha um, exhibits a virtue and resolves the troubles or problems of uh, the people and uh, brings happiness and peace for all. Now, uh, let us discuss the Sarbhanga Jataka, which uh, concerns us here. According to this one, uh, the Bodhisattva Sarbhanga is a hermit who lives in the Kavitha forest on the banks of the river Godavari. His chief disciple is Kisa Vacha. If you realize the name Kisa Vacha is a shrinked form of uh, the two names Nanda Vacha and Kisa Sankicha, right? So, uh, Kisa Vacha, after seeking permission of his guru, Sarbhanga, uh, moves to the city Kumbhavati, ruled by the king uh, Dandaki. Something went terribly wrong and um, he somehow was considered an unlucky person over there. Uh, it was spread that if people would spit on him, their ill luck would vanish. And so, he was considerably humiliated and insulted by the people of Kumbhavati. Perhaps his teacher Sarbhanga got to know about this and Kisarvacha was called back to the hermitage of his teacher. And subsequently, the king Dandaki and his entire kingdom was destroyed, which perhaps was the punishment for ill-treating a saint. Soon after, Kisarvacha also died. And the Jataka says that his cremation was attended by innumerable ascetics and by a rain of heavenly flowers. I have already stated um, Makkali Gosal too uh, lived in the early 6th century and was a contemporary of both uh, Mahavira and Gautam Buddha. There are various stories behind his getting this name. Uh, according to the Jaina tradition, his father was a monkey or a monkali, meaning an ascetic who carried the image of a deity and sang religious songs for collecting alms. So he be, uh, being a son of uh, a monkali was named Mankali Putta. Also, since he was born in a cow shed or goshala, he was called uh, Mankhali Putta Goshala. However, according to the Buddhist Pali tradition, he is called Makkali Gosala. This name comes from the lowly profession that he was in in the early phase of his life when a wealthy man directed a comment uh, at him, Tata Ma Khali, meaning, my dear man, Take care lest you stumble. So he got the name Makkali. In the Chinese Buddhist tradition, he is called Maskari Gosali Putra. Maskari was his Gotra and Gosali was his mother's name. Panini, on the other hand, explains his name as indicating one who carries a bamboo staff. And there is one more meaning which comes from uh, Patanjali. Uh, according to Patanjali, the word uh, maskarin indicates those who preach don't perform actions 
quietism alone is desirable to you. Now this last one is interesting as it directly leads us to what Makkali Gosala was advocating. Now he denied freedom of action and freedom of will although he believed in the performance of action but he denied its efficacy. Staying quiet consisted of a greater good than the performance of action. So, he was an advocate of absolute determinism, which means that everything that has happened in the past or is happening in the present or will happen in the future is entirely preordained and just a play of the cosmic principles. This view is also labeled as fatalism. We are powerless and are bound to suffer come what may. But this school, despite its belief in fatalism, adhered to an extreme form of asceticism. Gosala instructed his disciples to follow four kinds of austerities, namely, number one, severe, two, fierce, three, abstinence from ghee and other delicacies, and four, complete disregard for pleasant and unpleasant food. He and his followers kept their bodies dirty and covered them only with mat clothing. They carried in their hands a bunch of peacock feathers. And interestingly, they practiced penances inside big earthen vessels. Such moral observances, austerities, severe ascetic practices were undertaken regardless of their belief in the ineffectiveness or fruitlessness of all such actions. Gosala believed that um, there are 84 lakh kalpas or periods of transmigration which one must pass through before one attains final beatitude. And these 84 lakh kalpas are to be endured both by the fools and the wise alike. It is only the wishful thinking of the wise that by performing moral actions and austerities, he can exhaust all the karmas accumulated in his past lives and put an end to his sufferings. And the fool on his part entertains himself with the hope of getting rid of all his pains finally. In reality, both are in the same boat. One has no control over the pleasures and pains one encounters during these transmigratory periods. They can neither be increased nor decreased in any way. One must go through all these designated or predetermined periods of suffering. Just as a ball of thread when thrown up in the air loosens and unwinds to its full length similarly. The fool and the wise alike go through the different phases of life till they reach the end of suffering. According to the Ajivika metaphysics, there are five indivisible atoms, earth, water, fire uh, and air uh, and life. The four atoms, earth, water, fire and air, combine and take different forms such as trees, mountains, gold, etc. Even pleasure and pain are atomic in nature. The fifth or the life atom which is endowed with knowledge when combined uh, with the other four atoms assumes the form of the jiva. The jiva alone has knowledge of the corporeal or material things. The life atom, due to its nature, can enter into the things made of um, the other four atoms and assimilate all the material qualities. The Ajivika concept of final release or moksha is quite interesting. According to this, there are two kinds of released persons. One, Sambodhaka. Uh, those who continue to exist in the stage of uh, beatitude and two, Mandala, who come down to earth to reveal the sacred scriptures to the people in this world. And this they do only to keep the samsara or the world to continue. 
For if all the jivas were to attain moksha, there would be no witness or knower of the sansara. It is believed that uh, the Ajivikas found great support in Emperor Ashoka, who allocated two cave dwellings for them. This sect was promoted even by uh, the grandson of Emperor Ashoka. There are evidences suggesting that um, this sect flourished in South India also till the 13th or the 14th century AD and that it developed as a religion in Sri Lanka between 377 to 307 BC. Uh, the fourth ascetic teacher is Ajita Keshe Kambalin, associated with uh, the materialist uh, school of thought. He also belonged to the 6th century BCE. He was called by the name um, for he used to put around himself a blanket made of uh, human hair, which according to the Buddhist legend was extremely foul smelling and which remained cold in the cold weather and hot in the hot weather. There is another connotation um, attached to his name. Uh, the word Ajita means unconquered. Uh, he was called Ajita because he was quite argumentative and was unconquerable in debates. He led a very simple life and was admired by many people. I have already discussed his views in my previous lecture on the Charvaka school of Indian philosophy. So uh, now I will briefly discuss his views as are given in the Samanapala Sutta. And um, according to Ajit Kesh Kambalin, a human being is uh, made up of four elements. When he dies, the earthy returns uh, to earth, the fluid returns to water, the heat to fire, the windy to air and his um, faculties that is his sense organs and the mind pass into space. The dead man is put upon a bear and four men carry him till they reach the burning ground. The body, after being cremated, turns into ashes. The bones take the color of dove's wing. Giving of arms and performance of sacrifices are blatant lies of the fraudsters who speak of the existence of soul. After the body dies, both the fools and the wise perish in the same way. No one survives death. So there is no good in performing sacrifices. No merit or demerit results from good or bad actions. There is no world other than this one, no afterlife. No one through knowledge can experience this or any other world. He thus rejected all religious codes, all moral laws and perhaps all social norms. As discussed already, he believed only in the hedonist principle of eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we may die. Now the fifth ascetic teacher of the Shramana uh, tradition is Sanjay Bilatiputta. He is associated with the skeptic school of thought. Bilatiputta is attached to his name because he belonged to the Bilati clan. He was also known by the name uh, Parivrajaka Sanjaya. He had great followers like Mahamogalanna and um, Sariputta who later became the disciples of Buddha. The Jaina traditions however um, consider them as the Jaina Munis. But um, there is a small story attached to these names uh, according to which it is said that when they both were leaving Sanjay Bilatiputta along with many of his uh, followers uh, to become Buddhist, Sanjay fainted and hot blood oozed out of his mouth. Both Mahamogalanna and Sariputta urged him to accept Buddha's doctrines but they could not persuade him. Ultimately, only few followers uh, joined Mahamogalanna and Sariputta to become Buddhists. Parivrajika Supiya was also a follower of Sanjay Bilattiputta. And I am reminded of a beautiful story related to Parivrajika Supiya, which I want to share with you. 
uh, once uh, Parivrajika Supaya was um, having a discussion with his student Brahmadatta in the royal park of uh, Ambalatika and the topic of discussion was the virtues of the Buddha, his dharma and his order. Supiya was um, continuously blaming and abusing the Dhamma and the order of Buddha while his student Brahmadat was praising them. And this took the shape of a dispute between the two. And this was the time when uh, Buddha along with his disciples had taken a temporary shelter at the royal park of Ambalitika uh, uh, while uh, travelling from Rajagriha to Nalanda. And it so happened that uh, some of the disciples of Buddha heard this whole debate between Supaya and Brahmadatta. And in the morning, when all the monks uh, gathered in the uh, central pavilion, they discussed amongst themselves the dispute between Supaya and Brahmadatta. That how the wanderer ascetic Supaya was finding faults with the Buddha, the Dhamma and the order and how his disciple was defending the same and yet closely following the great Lord with his followers. Buddha knowing what all uh, this commotion was about went to the central pavilion, took his seat, asked what they all were discussing and he said to them, if anyone criticizes me or the Dhamma or the order, do not get angry or upset because anger or displeasure is only a hindrance that would affect you and you would fail to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Rather, you should explain to those who criticize that it is a fall, it is false or incorrect, that um, it is not found among us. Similarly, if one praises me, the Dhamma or the order, do not get excited or pleased because excitement or pleasure is only a hindrance that would affect you. Rather, you should just acknowledge that it is right, it is correct, that is what is found among us. Anyway, uh, coming back to the point, uh, the Buddhist or the Pali tradition regards the views of Sanjay Bilati Putta as endless equivocations. They say that Sanjay Bilati Putta wriggles like an eel on questions to which he has no answer. And in order to save his face and avoid disgrace, he resorts to evasive statements which make no sense. His metaphysical views as given in the Samanapala Sutta are the following. If you ask me whether there is future existence, a Paraloko, well, if I believed that there was, I should say so, but I do not say so. And I do not say it is thus or this. I do not say it is otherwise. And I do not say that it is not so, nor do I say it is not not so. If you ask me whether there is no future existence, na athi paraloko, well, if I believed that there wasn't, I should say so, but I do not say so. And I do not say it is thus or this. And I do not say it is otherwise. And I do not say that it is not so. Nor do I say it is not not so. If you ask me whether there is and is not another world, a teacher, not teacher, but a loco. Well, if I believed that there was and was not, I should say so. But I do not say so. And I do not say it is thus or this. And I do not say it is otherwise. And I do not say that it is not so. Nor do I say it is not not so. If you ask me whether there neither is nor is not another world. Na eva ti No, na ti paraloko. Well, if I believed that there neither was nor was not, I should say so. But I do not say so. And I do not say it thus or this. 
and I do not say it is otherwise and I do not say that it is not so nor do I say it is not not so. Now, G.P. Uh, Malalasekar in the dictionary of uh, the Pali proper names says uh, it is probable that Sanjay suspended his judgments only with regard to those questions, the answers to which must always remain a matter of speculation. It may be that uh, he wished to impress on his followers uh, the fact that the final answer to these questions lay beyond uh, the domain of speculation and that he wished to divert their attention from fruitless inquiry and direct it towards the um, preservation of uh, mental equanimity. Now, let us discuss the sixth ascetic leader, Niganta. Nataputta. According to the Samanafala Sutta, Niganta Nataputta is the teacher of the doctrine Chatu Yama Samavara, meaning the fourfold restraint. It is stated that a Niganta is surrounded by the barrier of fourfold restraint. How is he surrounded? He practices restraint with regard to water. He avoids all sin. By avoiding sin, his sins are washed away. And he is filled with the sense of all sins are washed away. And he is filled with the sense of all sins avoided. By practicing the fourfold restraint, um, his mind becomes firm and perfect. The Nigantas avoided cold water as living beings live in cold water. For them, non-violence was a fundamental principle. Their movements were limited so that they did not even unintentionally destroy any living creature. For them, physical deeds were more blameworthy than the mental deeds. Meat eating was strictly prohibited by the Nigantas. Now, Niganta Nathaputta preached to his disciples that a slayer of a living creature, a stealer, an indulgent being with under, uh, unrestrained desires, an addict and a liar are all to be condemned. They are sinners and salvation or omniscience can be attained by practicing nakedness, control of mind, restraint from all kinds of attachments, severe austerities along with right knowledge. Now the Pali literature confirms uh, the omniscience of Niganta Nathaputta. It is to be noted here that uh, both Jainism and Buddhism spread within the same geographical area and during the same period. Therefore, ideological similarities or influence of one over the other was unavoidable. The Buddha wandered for six years in uh, search of enlightenment and quite possibly was also aware of uh, the Jaina doctrines. The Buddhist philosophy is based on the four noble truths. There is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is cessation of suffering and there is a way leading to the cessation of suffering. Jainism too teaches the same doctrines in its own unique style. Also, uh, Buddhism glorifies the four meditations called the Brahma Viharas, namely Metta or friendship, Karuna or compassion, Mudita which is delight and Upekha meaning indifference. Jainism also recommends these uh, for meditation to their followers. Both believe in the efficacy of present and past deeds, future life, rebirth and liberation. Both preach non-violence. However, eating flesh is not banned in Buddhism. They both reject the notion of God as the creator of the universe and believe in the worshipping of the sages of their sects. But there are dissimilarities also. Buddhism does not believe in soul. Whereas in Jainism, a purity of soul is essential for the attainment of salvation. 
so uh, it does believe in soul however if we go by the pali canon we have to admit that buddha had a more agreeable or positive view of uh, nigantanath putta than any of the other contemporary ascetic leaders despite many disagreements on many issues mm-hmm. now i wish to add something about uh, makkali gosala here Uh, he spent some six years at uh, Paniya Bhumi with uh, Mahavira as a wanderer, and uh, due to some doctrinal uh, differences, parted ways with uh, Mahavira and went to uh, Shravasti, where he attained perfection or Jainahood and became the leader of the Ajivika sect. He gained a lot of followers and uh, popularity during this time. maybe some 16 years later mahavira visited shravasti and upon knowing the teachings of the ajivika gosala he condemned him and declared him as a fraud or a pretender as a consequence gosala along with his followers angrily went to the place where mahavira was staying and there gosala declared mahavira uh, declared to mahavira that uh, he was not the same gosala who was uh, his associate the original gosala was dead the soul now present in gosala's body is that of uday who was only an infant but whose soul had already taken seven bodies before inhabiting that of gosala's so gosala was only reanimated through the soul of uday would they further reveal to mahavira that his soul has already passed through the 84 lakh kalpas by inhabiting in all forms of bodies in the determined order and that this was his last or final birth in which he at an early age became an ascetic anyway i'll discuss the teachings of nigantanatha putta in detail in my next lecture on jainism as i already mentioned before that nigantanatha putta is none other than the uh, mahavira the 24th tirthankara of the jaina school of thought thank you so much